Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for coming. My name is Sabina Jessen. I'm the National Director of the Oceans Program for the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. Um, and uh, we're going to take a little different approach to uh, the first part of this evening. And I'm going to be having uh, kind of an informal chat with my uh, colleagues here to my left, who I'll be introducing momentarily. Um, and what we'll be talking about is the discovery of the reefs, uh, their, their importance, um, and uh, kind of tracing it back to uh, back in time and why these sponge reefs are so significant. So hope you'll enjoy the conversation we're going to have. And <laughs> it's uh, not really very scripted, and uh, <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. It's a bit of an experiment. So um, anyway, hope, wish us luck up here. <laughs> Um, so, uh, to my immediate left um, is Kim Conway. Kim is a marine geologist um, who works out of the Pacific Geoscience Centre in um, Sydney, which is part of the Geological Survey of Canada. And uh, together with his colleague, Vaughn Berry, Kim discovered and documented the glass sponge reefs in Hecate Strait. Um, in um, the late 1980s. Uh, Kim's been with the Geological Survey for over 30 years, and he's worked on many aspects of marine geology on the Canadian West Coast and in the Western Arctic. Um, he's mapped much of the Western Canadian continental shelf, and he's published extensively on the geology of the continental margins, the fjords, and coastal areas. Um, he's focused his work on marine habitat mapping, especially sponge and coral benthic habitats. And um, uh, between 1999 and 2008, Kim and Manfred, who is sitting beside him, led a collaborative Canadian and German sponge reef, reef project, which they'll talk about uh, a bit later. So, and beside Kim is Dr. Manfred Crowder, who has come uh, all the way from Germany to be part of the evening tonight. Um, he's a paleoecologist and geologist from Stuttgart in Germany. He has a diploma in geology and paleontology and a PhD in geology, both from the University of Stuttgart, and he's held professorships at Hanover University and um, in the Institute of Geology and Paleontology in Stuttgart. Um, in Manfred's work, he's focused on the ecology and taxonomy of prehistoric Jurassic sponges and sponge reef ecosystems. And uh, together with Kim and Von Berry, who I mentioned earlier, Manfred was one of the first scientists to study the biology and ecology of the glass sponge reefs found on our coast. So I'm going to start with Kim, and um, I'm going to ask you about, you know, can you believe it was almost 30 years ago when you uh, were doing the surveys on the North Coast and discovered the sponge reefs? So um, maybe you can tell us a bit about the work you were doing and what led to the, uh, what led to the discovery and kind of what it looked like. What, what did you actually see? What did, how did you find them? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Sabina. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks Is for it that on? nice introduction. There oh, there I'm. There. I'm here now. <laughs> uh, thanks for that nice introduction, Sabina. Great to be here talking about the glass sponge reefs and uh, answering your question. Yeah, the uh, work we were doing at the time there was was not very much known about the continental shelf of British Columbia. It was kind of basic hydrographic or bathymetric charts out there, but the geology, the geologic history of the entire shelf was really kind of a mystery. There'd been a couple of uh, PhD efforts out there, so there wasn't much known. So we were doing mapping work that was really the first look at the continental shelf in a serious way that had ever been done. So as a consequence, we encountered, um, you know, uh, lots of unknown real estate uh, in the surveys we were doing. So maybe I could just start the first slide up. And, uh, <laughs> and so these, are, I'm just going to go through a few slides that show the kinds of data we'd collect over the years. So these are different vintages of data that we we were able to use to, to do our mapping work. So as Sabina mentioned, I'm with the Geological Survey of Canada and part of our responsibility is to map uh, the Canadian landscape, including the offshore, uh, which includes, of course, the continental shelf of British Columbia. So the slide you're looking at here is uh, basically a simple profile. So if you went up with an echo sounder today, a fish finder, you'd kind of see a bottom like that. You probably wouldn't go through those big mounds. You would have a ping off the top and show the rough surface. 
Um, so in the case of these, uh, these data, they're uh, profile data that actually you can see right through the mound. So you can see they're kind of transparent and you actually see an underlying surface below the mound features. So the biggest mound there is about 20 meters thick and about 200 meters across. So these are the kind of scale of features that we first encountered in 1984 without any idea of what they were. And it would take us some years to actually arrive at a conclusion as to what these very large uh, mound features were in northern Hecate Strait. So a couple of the tools we use, so we have the hull mounted profile data that you saw in the last image. These are two tools that we tow behind the vessel to allow mapping to, to occur that gives us a three-dimensional sense of what's on the seafloor. So uh, the tool on the, on the left is a uh, profiler, a, a simple um, uh, towed profiler that can dive deep to get a good resolution of the seafloor. And it can see into the seabed and below the seabed, so that determines the kinds of sediments that are are the seabed is composed of and can look down essentially through the seafloor to about 100 meters in, in depth below the seafloor, looking at all the sediments in the accumulated strata below the seafloor. The tool on the, on the right is a side scan sonar that gives you essentially a plan view of the seabed as you tow it behind the vessel. So looking out uh, two or 300 meters on each side of that towed, we call it a tow fish, each side of that towed body you see um, a, a uh, plan view sense. So between the two tools, you get a pretty good idea of the three-dimensional shape of any object on the seabed. So you might use these systems for shipwrecks or just general exploration, and that's indeed what we were doing, is, is mapping the geology with these tools. Uh, and these are the kinds of data that uh, well, were provided. In this case, on the left, we see uh, a very non-reflective or white area on top of a dark area. That's a side scan image. So we encountered these kinds of seabeds where the sponge reefs are. Of course, at the time, 84 to 88, we had no idea that's what we were seeing, but it turned out that's indeed what they were. The image on the right is a profile or cross-section cut through the seafloor with that seismic tool. So you're looking into the seabed in the right down about, uh, about 60 me uh, 40 meters into the seafloor, and you can see there's that nice sort of fluffy layer of about 5 to 6 meters thickness at the top of that image, that's the thickness of sponge reef that, um, that is at this site. And between the two of them, you can see how the, um, so this little, uh, uh, I guess, part of the sponge reef area here is this thickness of, of reef here. So between the two systems, you get sort of a, a general impression of where the reef is distributed and where it's not. So where it's uh, fluffy and white, that's the sponge reef, and where it's not, uh, where it's darker, that's the glacial sediment um, that the sponge reefs sit on. The water depths uh, at this site is about 220 meters deep, and that's a general case where we find, find the reefs both in the north and Hecate Strait, and in this case it's from southern Queen Charlotte Sound. Um, so maybe the next one, please. Uh, so um, actually this is the, I think one of the first images was ever collected on the top of one of these mound features. So. Uh, we did have a, a time getting a camera down onto these things for about four years. We had a, we, one time we brought in a remote an early remote operated vehicle. It was actually the early version of Ropos that you'll see later. Uh, the vehicle at that time was called the High Sub 5000 and we had a lot of trouble with that vehicle in 1988. So it was uh, called the High Sub 5000 because it went to dive to 5,000 meters deep. And as it had problems, we kept crossing off zero, so it became high sub 500, <laughs> high sub 50, and finally we couldn't use it at all. So this is, we had to go back to the old technology and uh, use this simple pogo stick camera, which is basically a camera you bounce up and down on the bottom without any idea of what kind of information you're getting, and then you recover that whole device from the sea bed. It's about three times the size of this little stand here the sponge is sitting on and you bounce that up and down listening to a pinger as it hits the bottom and you bring it up and drift and put it back down and we did this maybe 200 times over one of these big mound features and we got that camera back and took the took the film canister out and developed the film in a dark room and, and, and we, we were looking at that and I think my colleague Bon Barry said to me, I've never seen a seafloor like that before of you and no we hadn't and it turned out nobody else had either. So, so when did you actually get the images after you, s like these photographic images after you saw the other, uh, got the sonar kind of uh, images? At what point did, did you finally see the sponges for the yeah. first time? Uh, yes, it had taken us um, uh, uh, two years of surveying before we had the first image in our hands. And, and actually, um, because it's such an elaborate process to take 
uh, black and white printing equipment to see. We had equipment to develop the negatives, but then we're using a hand lens to actually look at the print or look at the negative to determine actually what's on the seafloor. So this was a really, um, you know, this is we have the two extremes of technology on display tonight in this the talk you'll see later. I guarantee that. So the next couple of slides just show how the technology of mapping these uh, um, uh, seafloor seafloor areas has changed over the years. Okay, so what this is, as you can see, it sort of looks like a bunch of strips uh, stuck together, and that's what it is. This is repetitive side scan sonar strips gathered into an image. So the light areas are the sponge reefs, mm -hmm. and the dark areas are the glacial substrate they sit on. This is about 200 meters water depth, northern Hecate Strait, the first area we really, really examined um, later on. Um, so this was a very elaborate way to get at the distribution of these features on the seafloor. So a lot of room for error, a lot of uh, room for making mistakes in the actual the shape of these bodies on the seabed. So the area you're looking at is about, um, it's about 12 kilometers long and about six kilometers wide. So it's a big area. It's kind of the size of, I guess, Coquitlam or something. We're trying to get at where the reefs are and where they're not in an area the size of Coquitlam. So it's quite a challenge. Um, and the multicolored track there is one of our uh, submersible dives that we did that shows the distribution of sponges on this surface but maybe we'll just jump to the next slide now and uh, starting in 2003 we we're able to use a much more modern technology to get at the spatial distribution of these sponge reefs which occupy these very large areas as I mentioned it's kind of the size of Coquitlam or or that scale that you're looking at you have to be able to map kilometers of area in order to understand where the sponge reefs are and where they're not and their features up to 20 meters high and hundreds of meters in area. So a shape maybe the size of this building, maybe not quite as tall, but this would be a small sponge reef. This, this whole building we're, we're in today would be a small, a small sponge reef if it covered that footprint. Um, so this vessel is the vector and it is equipped with a multi-beam system and this multi-beam sonar has allowed us to map these reefs in much better resolution and detail. It gives us great confidence that we know where the reefs are and where they're not. We can see each reef up to perhaps greater than 50 meters, we're very confident. We know the distribution of the reefs on the seafloor and the <coughs> exact location um, that they sit on. And uh, we have an example of that data in the next image. At this site in the southern reef, there's the four reef complexes that we're going to talk about. And the next slide shows the kinds of data that um, these uh, multi-beam systems generate. So you can see the kind of stripey pattern. That's the one pass of the ship. It's looking it's looking with a, an array of sounders, about 120 sounders in the case of the system on the vector, and each sounder is, is um, uh, uh, tied into the computing system to locate each ping. So that's millions and millions of data points all compiled into this three-dimensional image. So the ship runs back and forth on these tracks, and you see the striping is the back and forth pattern the ship makes as it goes back and forth across that seabed. And again, in this area, it's about 200 meters deep, so each swath is uh, kind of uh, 500 meters across. So the whole area is about uh, uh, 10 kilometers by uh, maybe 8 or 9 kilometers in area. So it's quite a large area sponge reef. And with the old systems we had, that uh, the profile data I showed you, plus the side scan and Huntec, we determined this... Uh, um, this to be the distribution. As you can see, this large lobate body was discovered in 2004 during the survey. There was actually a big area of sponge reef. This is about uh, four kilometers by two kilometers. That was the area of sponge reef that was found during the survey. So we thought we had a pretty good idea using that stripey kind of side scan data of the distribution of these reefs. But until multi-beam was available, uh, we only had a very rough idea of the true distribution of, of the sponge reefs on the seabed. And I think the next one might be my last uh, of these. So when you combine the, the bathymetric data, which is the last image I showed you, you can put nice color ramps on it. You can color it how you want and manipulate it in space once it, it's in that kind of package of points. Um, and what also you can do is drape the reflectivity data on top of that, which gives you a sense of the differences in the seafloor texture. So the sponge reefs are very soft and non-reflective, and we can render that as a black color on a, on a much lighter color here, which is somewhat more reflective. So right away, you can get a sense of the relief of the, the non-reflective sponge reefs against the glacial sediments in the background. So it's a very, very accurate way to 
uh, locate the reefs and, and we can quickly use this in any situation to get a sense that there is sponge reefs down there. We still can't determine if there's living sponges on them, but we can say with certainty that there are sponge reefs there by these characteristics. Very low ref reflectivity and high undulatory uh, seabed. Okay. Now I've got a question for Manfred. So you didn't know that these reefs had been discovered in British Columbia and this was the first paper that uh, Kim and his colleagues published uh, about the glass sponge reefs. So maybe tell us a bit about how you discovered it and, and the work that you had been doing in, in Germany and in Europe on uh, glass sponge reefs. Well, yeah, I was working on, being a paleontologist, I was working on fossilized uh, sponge reefs, which are well known in Earth history. Um, and I, I did for about 15 to 20 years research on those reefs spreading all over Europe. And um, I, I finished my postdoc more or less when, you know, when I tumbled over this uh, publication. I was looking for information about ecology, paleoecology of, of sponges and it was pretty hard so I switched over to, the, uh, to look for in, on the biological side of, of this data, you know, to, to, to apply this data and interpret the fossilized sponge. Uh, so, well, yeah, um, being a paleontologist, it was clear, no doubt, that these reefs had died out 40 million years ago. That was clear, and you can still read that in the, in the, in the book, student books. So, when reading this title, Holocene Sponge by Herms, first, you know, I just, I couldn't believe it. You know, so they, they, did, they did wrong, so, but, <laughs> yeah, but there were nice pictures in that paper. <laughs> and, you know, I, it was obviously clear that they found something which we paleontologists thought they had died out. So I nearly fell from my chair when, you know, when reading the paper carefully and still took, took me some time to, to get over it, you know, to get to accept that. So um, obviously these four authors, they described something which they didn't know that it has to be died out actually. So <laughs> they described the dinosaur running around somewhere in the prairies, <laughs> you know, and well, I couldn't, I really couldn't believe it. It took me really some time. So, but anyway, after that, I... So wait, what year, huh? uh, what, tell, tell me the chronology here. Discovered in 87, this yeah. paper was published in 91, 91, and you found it when? In 97. Why did it take so, so long? Well... <laughs> are, you, are you just I a slow I didn't know that that was published, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it is a newspaper, Continental Shelf Research, where paleontologists are not looking in that's, you know, very <laughs> borrowed somewhere, you know, so by fortune, it was just by fortune I tumbled over this, uh, this paper, and that was, you know, six years after it was published. So that means Kim and his crew, you know, they just discovered actually the sponge reefs in 87, in 97. I contacted Kim and asked him, you know, if he could do kind of a joint venture, Canadian-German joint venture to do some research on the recent reefs and its fossil reefs. So, and since 90, no, 99, it took us some years to get money and get ship time and, you know, it's not, it's, it's not that cheap to do such, such kind of research. And since 99, we're working close together to, you know, to do some kind of research. You know, here are nice pictures of the fossil, fossilized sponge reefs here that's uh, on the left, on your left. Uh, that's the upper Danube in southern Germany, that little river, you hardly can see it, coils down to the Black Sea and in the center of the, well, I don't know it now, you can see it, yeah, yeah. And in the center of the picture you can see a nice monastery. For those who, were, who have been there in Germany, it's beautiful. It's the Grand Canyon of Germany here. <laughs> so that's uh, the monastery Beuron. And all these white cliffs you can see all over the, uh, well, the flanks of the, of the Danube River, these are fossilized sponge reefs. Yeah. And how high are they? They are about 150 meters high, the biggest. Well, the smallest are, oh, well, maybe two meters in diameter. It different, different, differs uh, variably, uh, differs very much. So, but these one we can see here are the tallest one, the biggest one we have in Germany, 150 meters high. 
The monastery here is an eight-story building, the church. So that gives you maybe a little bit of scale, you know, about the size of these reefs. You know, and I was working for 15 years with, with these rocks. You know, there were these, these uh, Canadian guys who, who published, you know, data about a living reef. So I was completely, you know, electrified. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and in the middle, that's a, a nice fossil sponge from Spain. You can see how beautiful they are preserved. Yeah. And you still can see all the architecture of the spicules, the skeleton of the, of the sponge. And that was what I actually did. I cut those things, you know, made thin sections and looked at, at the spicules to identify the genus, the species. Yeah. So how to work in, in, in on the modern side, biological side, identifying sponges is as well looking at the speculation of the, of the, the sponge. So that differs actually not too too far. And yeah, on behind me here, that's uh, a nice little um, weekend house on top of such a, <laughs> a sponge reefs, fossilized sponge reefs. They are all over. And the next please. In, uh, in Jurassic times, that means this year 145 million years ago, these uh, sponge reefs, they didn't spread only in Germany, they spread from the Caucasian mountains, Caucasus, over Poland, you know, that's a paleogeographic uh, map showing how the continents and distribution of the oceans were 145 million years ago. But um, here is Caucasus going all over middle Central Europe, Spain is here, you see there's a belt around Spain and it's going over to the coast of Newfoundland. We, we have, well, people have drilled these upper Jurassic uh, sponge reefs off the coast of Newfoundland. So building in the late Jurassic or upper Jurassic a sponge reef belt for more than 7,000 kilometers length. <coughs> so that was the largest bioconstruction built by animals which ever existed in Earth history those days. That's the Earth history from beginning from the Cambrian to, to nowadays. And the very first uh, uh, glass sponge reefs were known in the upper tri tri Triassic from China. So we have to go together to China to then I could show you the very first uh, sponge reefs. And next, please. And yeah, they died out. That actually, that was what we thought <laughs> they did. Yeah? They died out here 40 million years ago. So that means there is a gap for 40, mi 40 million years. And now we, we know that they didn't die out. But still, we have no idea why there is such a, such a long gap for that, you know. But it's pretty clear, it, they, we, we don't have any uh, proved sponge reefs uh, in this time slice here. Oh yeah, <laughs> you do, if, you, if you have uh, you know, uh, the money, go over to Germany, look at these uh, reefs, w beautiful, beautiful. But you can do it here in Vancouver as well. Just go to, where is it? This is Pacific Center. Pacific Center? <laughs> The floor of Pacific Center is, is polished rock of uh, German fossil sponge reefs. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a pretty easy way to, to look at those things. And, and one of the first times I brought Manfred over to Canada, <laughs> we walked into the F Fairmont Waterfront Hotel and he looks down at the floor and he goes, those are fossilized sponges down there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another place in Vancouver you can go and look. <laughs> yeah. Well, th thank you for that background, Manfred. Okay. So, Kim, what was it like when you got the letter from Manfred in the mail saying, like telling you what you had discovered? And then um, my understanding is that he invited you to Germany to actually see those fos fossilized reefs. So just what was, what was that whole part of it like after having discovered them and not really quite knowing what you what we had here? Well, we had a, we had a general sense that, um, you know, like uh, scientists are great ones to find a classification scheme or a way to categorize things. So we, we understood that there was no, uh, no sponge reefs around the world. We talked to a lot of oceanographers and the original paper in 91, they said this is something new to oceanography. Mm -hmm. So no oceanographers, no biologists had seen these before. But as geologists, that's one of the principal things we do is look back through time and we'd encountered a couple small discussions of, of, of sponge 
algal buildups, they were called, and they were small things like small outcrops in, in south central Germany, and we kind of referenced, I think, one of them in that paper saying this is the kind of, if you had to put this in your stamp collection, this is this new sponge reef that we found, you might stick it over here with, with these guys. But we had no way to get beyond that kind of just rough categorization of these, of these, uh, of these sponge biorms that we'd found. So when I was, uh, received the letter from Manfred saying, you know, he, this was his, this was, <laughs> This was actually uh, a system of reefs that you could see uh, across big parts of the world. I was, I was really amazed that that, that was the case and that um, he was, you know, uh, really happy to entertain a, a collaboration with us because we'd, we'd sort of, you know, uh, looked for a lot of people who could tell us more about these. But because it's, you know, when you find something new, it's very hard to accept that it's new. You always think, well, somebody's going to stand up at one of these meetings and say, yeah, we've got those in Russia or we've got those in Argentina. You know, those aren't new. But they were new. And uh, so when we got an offer of assistance to examine and, and look through time and space and actually find out other places where they had occurred, it was, it was thrilling. And uh, subsequently, we got a great partnership going to look at both the ancient reefs that give us a chance to come to, come to Europe uh, and look at, uh, look at reefs in Spain and Portugal and Germany, and uh, and led to us being able to, uh, with Manfred providing the, the resources to actually uh, bring uh, the project together through the German Research Foundation. Um, these are some images of of the reefs we walked over, and so the amazing memory I have is some of these places the sponges are so thick um, meters and meters of sponges piled up into rock formations and when you walk on them the sponge reefs uh, the sponges the individual fossils are falling out of the formations so it makes like a clinking sound of, of the sponges as they kind of rattle together as you walk on them and the fossils that come out of these formations are absolutely beautiful and all from the same time period 145 million years ago when this uh, amazing uh, sponge reef belt existed that, that Manfred spoke of. So to see this kind of a landscape uh, was was really amazing. Just an incredible opportunity to go and and uh, dive back through time and see how how we'd sensed these first in the modern case. But we were going the other way from Manfred. Manfred came from the past into the present. We went came from the present and dived down into a past that was a complete world of of sponges going from Romania to to off Newfoundland. So for us it was. Yeah, for, as geologists, it was really amazing. So um, after that, or around that time, so Manfred made the offer for a, some joint research. So you you went to see and do research on the glass sponge reefs here in British Columbia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> Is this you in the sub? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, a couple of years ago, but yeah. uh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that why I didn't recognize you? <laughs> so tell us a bit about the, uh, the first expedition to, uh, to see the reefs. And I mean, I can't even imagine what that must have been like for you uh, to see them for the first time. Well, yeah, you see me here going into that little uh, submersible, the Delta. Um, was, well, it was quite, quite um, exciting. I was lying uh, on the floor of that little sub, the pilot sitting on the back of, m of me, you know, and we drove out and slowly, you know, dived down to, I don't know, 150, 200 meters, and it gets dark and dark and dark and darker, pitch black. And then all of a sudden, you know, the torch lights went off, went on, and hey, there the reefs were, you know. It was a, a, um, a journey back 200 million years for me, and I, it was overwhelming, absolutely overwhelming. You know, I had no idea how they look, recent ones, and ev never, and ever. And then I was down on the bottom of the sea and saw them right before my, my eyes there, you know. Couldn't believe it, you know, I had no idea how they looked like, if, how, what, which color they had. No idea, you know, now I know they are slight yellowish or whitish or sometimes a little bit brownish, but uh, these things I have n had no idea about that. So. This actually was one of the most exciting moments in my life, I would say. Well, maybe just leave it here for a sec. So we'd arranged, Manfred had found this, uh, this uh, um, 
uh, resources in Germany from the German Research Foundation, and, and you know we f we found a ship. So he he brought all the all the equipment with him, and we brought people on the ship with us. But I remember when the Delta sub arrived at our institute, Institute of Ocean Sciences, over by by the airport on Vancouver Island near Victoria. So the container containing the su submersible arrived at our dock, and we opened the back doors, and this little submarine was buried in tires that they used to fender it off against the ship and I, and I looked at the sub and I thought is that our submarine and, <laughs> and I kind of thought oh Manfred hasn't seen this he, he doesn't know he's rented a Japanese suicide sub you know so <laughs> so. but it, it turned out to be a perfect tool and a great way to to explore these um, these reefs because it's made for continental shelf depths yeah. uh, many deep water submersibles have only very small portholes that are made to go much deeper into two or three thousand meters of water. This sub was purpose built to go to shelf depths of a maximum of 350 meters. So it was a perfect tool for our work. So um, what, what are some of the things that you did on, on the dive and what kind of information did you get? Okay, well this was a bit disturbing for you. And I guess there is sort of a, that th there's a story be between your research cruises because yeah. you did more than one together. Yeah, so maybe right. tell that story. Yeah, yeah. Well, when we first did our dives in 1999, 1999 um, we found pristine, wonderful, untouched reefs up in Hackett Strait. That was 99, and we dived um, three years later with a ROV, with a remotely operated vehicle. Uh, again, at some sites we saw already, and um, I have here two pictures. The left picture is an, a nice, pristine, untouched reef, and the right picture is what we saw three years later. So large parts of the reef were totally destroyed, you know, wiped off. But you just saw a desert, nothing else. So, and it was pretty obvious that this was the result of, of uh, deep sea trawling. Now, and since, actually since 2002, we are working to, to protect the reefs because, you know, if we wouldn't do that, they would be gone forever. So that was, very um, disappointing, you know, a, a sad view, actually. And um, yeah, if we wouldn't, you know, Sabine, if we wouldn't do, try to protect the reefs, nobody would do that, you know. So it's just our damn duty you know, to keep these reefs, you know, as they are pristine and wonderful, the last of, their, of the Earth history. So yeah. yeah, it's a little bit touching, the story, yeah. you know. <laughs> Emotionally, Make, yeah. ma makes Manfred emotional. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing we didn't talk about was some of the other work that you did on the on the the research you did on the sponge reefs. And one of the things you were able to figure out was how long they've been growing on the seafloor. Um, so you know, tell us a little bit more about some of the research you actually did on some of the on the cruises. Other than going down in the subs and looking at them, but I, mean yeah, I know you did a lot glamour. more that's while the you glamour the part glamour. For sure. yeah. <laughs> but the, yeah, that's that's a good point. And and the work we did involved a lot of the um, kind of I guess stock and trade that marine geology is, which I, I showed the seismic profiles. So measuring thicknesses of the reef, uh, we could get uh, samples of the surface. Uh, we do th uh, coring, so we can core right through that the mound structure down to. Um, 12 meters below the surface of the mound right into the substrate below and then analyze the, the long core that we recover and look at time slices in that core to see how how time has affected that reef site. So we could say the reef had continuously uh, grown there for um, that period of thickness which um, we would be able to with our coring system get about 12 meters of core recovery. We could radiocarbon age shell, a few shells that are found in that thickness of core and we were getting ages of uh, five to six thousand and extrapolating those ages down to the fullest uh, thickness of uh, those mounds we were able to extrapolate an age of about eight eighty five hundred years I think was to to nine thousand was about the oldest age we could extrapolate our radiocarbon ages of the cores too so we know those reefs have been growing essentially through much of the climate situation we're in today after the ice age had had uh, had ended other work we did included uh, uh, deploying oceanographic moorings and collecting suspended sediment that was falling out, an important uh, link uh, to the, uh, the sunlit realm above at the sea surface where all the 
uh, all the action is happening for plants and animals normally, that material rains out and is, is feeding the reef. So we were able to sample that material that was raining out in oceanographic moorings. We were able to take current meter measurements and determine what currents were affecting the sponge reefs in the troughs. So we did uh, a, a lot of these kinds of studies and worked with oceanographers and biologists and, and others, foraminifera specialists, others to get at a lot of different aspects to the reef. It, it was um, really a team effort to get at the science story behind the actual observations and the and the fun of going down in the submersible and, and the, uh, yes. Manfred, was it all fun in the submersible? <laughs> well, it was fun, but damn cold as well. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was about four centigrades. There was no heating system in that little sub. And how long so were you down? How long would well, each dive take? Well, I think the most, most four, four hours. Uh -huh. Well, that's enough. It's <laughs> Yeah. You're ready to come up. Oh, yeah, 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 because you have to comment everything. Because you have to first you have to take picture slides, then you have to direct the pilot, then you have to comment everything you see because it was um, what is that? Um, it was taking video constantly videos. Mm -hmm. So you what you're talking is recorded as well. So you did at least three times at the same time multitasking. And that's quite quite exhausting, you know. So after two and a half hour, three hour you we usually get up and Mm -hmm. Yeah, relaxed. So, so yeah. what kind of animals would you see down there? I mean, you're obviously seeing all these sponges, yeah. but what else, what else would you be seeing down there? Well, now from the point of view of a paleontologist, I saw exactly the same animals I knew wow. from, the th from the fossil records. You know, we had echinoderms, different, you know, sea stars, mm -hmm. brittle stars, we had uh, holothurians, different fish. Uh, well, under the microscope, you could see the same from Nifera, small unicellular organisms, which I knew from the Jurassic time, they are still there. So it was really the same ecological niche which I knew from my fossil record. So this, this ecological re uh, niche um, is now known since more than 200 million years, has never changed. That's but but when we so when we talked the other day so every time I meet with Manfred I learn something new about the glass sponge reefs and I've been talking to him for 15 years <laughs> so <laughs> and uh, so when we talked this week one of the things you mentioned is that there is actually a difference though between the glass sponge reefs that we see on the BC coast and and the ones that are that you studied in fossilized form in Europe so maybe you could just describe that briefly. Yeah. Well, speaking of the, the reefs here in BC, these reefs are uh, produced or created only by three different species of sponges. Hydrocone, calyx, the finger goblet sponge, Aphocalistus vastus, <laughs> the cloud sponge, and another sponge who has just a Latin name, Faria oca. These three species, they create the reefs. Only three. And if you're going back, in Jurassic times, we have, well, let's say 40 to 50 different species. Yeah. So this niche, niche is extremely narrow. And from, a, from the, the view of an ecologist, paleoecologist, a very narrow ecological niche is um, always in danger. That means if the, the environmental conditions will change, the reefs will be gone. Yeah. So it depends, of course, how, how much the environmental conditions will change. But they are very, very sensitive. Um, so we've also discovered reefs. Kim, you've discovered reefs, not we, <laughs> um, in the Strait of Georgia. Uh, and more recently than the ones in, in Hecate Strait. Was that a surprise? Um, yeah, it was the um, uh, reefs in the Strait of Georgia. Uh, the great thing about the Canadian Hydrographic Service is they run these multi-beam systems now. Uh, all over the place and we're able to get these data and look and identify sponge reefs quite readily. So the first ones that were found were at Fraser Ridge I think in 2002 or 2000, 2003 and I think Sally's spent more time there than anybody else uh, by far. Uh, but that, has the, that was the first reef found in the Strait of Georgia. Subsequently we found um, quite a few others. Um, and uh, we also found them at the northernmost fjord in British Columbia, which is here as Portland Canal, this boundary between Alaska and BC. These were uh, discovered in one of these uh, opportunistic multi-beam surveys by uh, the Hydrographic Service. Uh, Portland Canal here showing the, the colored multi-beam data on the seabed. 
and we found uh, nice uh, sponge reefs at these sites. We're able to use our backscatter and multi-beam bathymetry uh, pairing to get at the uh, distribution of the reefs. And the next slide shows some of those uh, seabed areas. Um, they're very nice furia. I think this is the shallowest furia uh, occurring. I think it's around 80 meters that we find furia at these sites. So these sites are all a little bit different. They have either more sediment or more sponges. So if you go from the house sound uh, sites to the northernmost sites, you find uh, each reef is a bit special and different with uh, different sediment input versus sponge growth rate. So some of the, some of the sites will be completely dominated by massive sponges with very little sediment. Other sites, much more sediment and fewer sponges. So there's quite a bit of variety in the reefs you encounter. Uh, and the next one, I think, uh, yes, just recently in Chatham Sound, uh, the sponge reefs discovered during a, uh, a, root, a root survey for a, a gas pipeline. So reefs are occurring in different areas. Uh, I know that in Howe Sound, some uh, uh, diving teams, volunteer scientists, uh, citizen scientists are finding reefs in Howe Sound as well uh, in, in other areas, including, as I mentioned, Alaska. We've, uh, Bob Stone in NOAA has worked up there and found small ones uh, up there as well. So uh, there is more reefs being found uh, in the British Columbia mainland as intro areas are explored, as more multi-beam data are collected. But uh, just to keep in mind, if we have the next slide, um, so these are the areas of interest. This is the sponge reef explored. Uh, this, this portion I would say was the area we spent almost all our diving time in, a little bit over here in three cruises. So, th uh, so this is a map. If you put all f the, the major sponge reefs in Hecate Strait on one diagram, th that's the, that's th the, thanks, the, the that outline of them. That's right. right. This, yeah. is, this, is the, this is the A, B, C, D on the map. Yeah. They were organized north to south. And yeah. this is a 20 kilometer scale bar showing the scale of the sponge reefs in Queen Charlotte Basin. That's Hecate Strait and Queen Charlotte Sound form Queen Charlotte Basin. And comparing that to the Georgia Basin sponge reefs, here's the group of sponge reefs along the Galliano Ridge. Here's Fraser Ridge, um, other ones. This is the House Island Cluster. So I just include this reef to compare the scale of reef uh, organization at these different sites. So yeah, that just, just to keep in mind, as these small areas are discovered, uh, smaller sponge reefs are certainly important. They give us a great opportunity to examine how the reefs are occurring in different areas. Uh, there could be great sites for future science work that aren't as remote getting out to these big, massive reef areas in Hecate Strait is challenging with weather issues, with uh, equipment issues, et cetera. Inshore, you find reefs that are much more accessible, more readily studied, uh, without a massive expense of equipment and a huge ship to protect you from some of the fierce uh, storms that you get offshore. Uh, so in front of us, we have a glass sponge, which um, Kim gave to Sea Paws to use as a mascot. We call him Mr. Stinky. Um, because when we first got him and we had him in the car, he was really stinky. <laughs> and we had to drive with the windows down. And, uh, but um, Mr. Stinky has met most ministers of fisheries and oceans. Uh, he's been to Ottawa, uh, to Parliament Hill, and uh, we've put him to very good use. And as you can see, Kim, we've taken very good care of him. He's in pretty good shape, actually. He looks great, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now, where did you um, find where did you get Mr. Stinky from? Which, which reef did you get him from? Uh, Mr. Stinky comes from North McCall Bank Reef, which <laughs> is off Seychelles. Um, it's an area of predominantly heteroconi, uh, very large ones, uh, not a real dense reef, uh, but it has small waveforms that uh, are, are really interesting. And so it's a waveform reef, maybe four meters thick, and Mr. Stinky was sampled in order to get, uh, get a representative uh, sponge from the site to uh, to uh, analyze further. Mm -hmm. So Manfred, when you look at this sponge, what, what can you tell me about the growth on this sponge? Like, what do you see when you look at this? Well, um, I, have to, I have to say that this, guy, this genus is no, known since 100 million years. So it's pretty old, not this uh, individual, but it's <laughs> known since, uh, the genus is known since Cretaceous times. So it's a pretty old guy actually. So what I see, I can see that these protrusions, you know, these finger-like things, when they, when they touch and you know, come close to each other, they can fuse together. And they can do that with other sponges as well. And you know, if, if, you, uh, if you do that, you create a three-dimensional three 
multidimensional framework. And that is exactly what we call a reef. You know, if another sponge grows up here, you know, touches the, the sponge beside it, uh, grows together, that forms a 3D framework, and that is a reef in the sense of, of paleontologists, you know. The yellow part, the bright part is living, or was living. <laughs> was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Sally, maybe, I don't know, maybe 120, 150 years. Uh, it's very hard to say. Still, there's still a lot of work to do, how fast they grow. Uh, we have s several observations, actually indirect observations. Then we, we can say that these uh, sponges can grow, are able to grow pretty fast, one centimeter per year. But they can they can grow nothing uh, per year, you know. So it depends from the um, environment where they are. Uh, well, yeah, there's still a lot of work to do concerning the sponges. Mm -hmm. They are most the most enigmatic animals, I think, which are on Earth. How delicate are they? Oh, very, very, very fragile. They yeah, are very fragile. Yeah, the uh, the devices we use are, have to say are, weren't especially gentle, and usually the sponge was not in pristine condition coming aboard in a in a sediment sampler. Our gear tends to be fairly heavy, so that this the sponges were often um, often broken up. This guy was was sampled ca very carefully with a remote operated vehicle with an adapted fishnet scoop, so we were able to get part of the sediment underneath him, whereas our samplers are always sampling from the top. So once we realized what was down there, we were much carefuler, much more careful about how we sampled and where we sampled and the kinds of density of sampling we did. Um, because our, uh, our samplers are made to grab gravels and cobbles and things like this, and these guys are very, very fragile. I'll just close this part of our, our evening and, and thank Manfred and Kim very much for, uh, for being here and sharing some of the, the history and excitement of discovering the, the glass sponge reefs on the BC coast.